what I want to talk about today and what I would basically would, would give a title to this is, you know, what is a soul and when does it come to be? Okay. And I want to talk about that specifically from the perspective of philosophy, or the traditional philosophy that I occupy, a broadly Aristotelian, Thomistic tradition of philosophy. Because I think uh, what, it, what we mean by a soul is, is largely misunderstood, and I think it's largely badly presented by people in this tradition, which makes controversies look even worse than they are. So what I want to do first, I want to talk about what I don't mean by a soul, uh, what I, and I think this is probably what most people do mean by a soul. Okay. Uh, if I had a different word than soul, I would be happy to use it, okay? But everyone insists on using this word, uh, so I'll stick with it. So let me begin by talking about just what is it that leads something like uh, the, the Catholic position on these things to, to sort of become controversial. So there's three claims, I think, that are in play here. Generally, we think that lives of human persons are due inviolable uh, respect, you know, from conception to natural death, okay? Uh, that, that, that's certainly a view that, that my tradition represents. Two, we think that sufficient for being a human person is the presence of something like a human soul, okay? So if it has a soul, it's a person, and the, thereby has rights. And three, uh, a soul is, once again, present from conception to natural death, so then it would seem to be wrong to kill human beings, right, during that entire duration. Okay. The problem with those three claims is uh, there, are, there are few people who will deny the first one, the claim that human persons have a, an invaluable right to life. Okay. There are exceptions to this. right? Uh, more likely, though, there are plenty of people that are willing to deny that uh, human beings have souls from the moment of their conception till the end of their natural lives. Okay. That's the, that's the controversial question, okay? Um, and so I actually think if what is typically meant by a soul, you're right to deny that claim, okay? Uh, I just don't share the conception. So what do people typically mean by souls? Well, I think in, in the modern tradition, you know, for the last 300 years or so, what's typically meant by a soul uh, is usually interchangeable with other words like person, or mind, or self, or something like that, okay? Um, and with that, we associate certain mostly psychological characteristics, like self-consciousness, uh, ability to plan for a future, right? Um, you know, personality traits, you know, specifically, you know, my, my having likes and dislikes, that sort of thing. Uh, a very common way of thinking of, of personhood or soul, having a soul in this way is to think of it in terms of having a coherent stream of memories. So the idea is a, a person comes online as soon as you can link a number of memories together to say, I remember doing that, and I predict that I'll do this in the future. Okay. Uh, maybe free choice has something to do with it. Now, uh, which parts of that psychological package are essential to having a soul or being a person Immensely controversial among philosophers. Um, some would say all of that. Some would say just one of it. I, I, I have no interest in wading into that. The, the point, though, is, is the common view of what we mean by having a soul or having a mind is something psychological, right? It's a kind of consciousness, all right? And it's absolutely obvious that that sort of consciousness very much has a shorter duration than the natural lifespan of something like a human organism, right? I mean, a, 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 a human fetus prior to birth is not down there making plans for lunch today, right? In there, I guess not down there. In there, <laughs> making plans for lunch, right? Uh, you know, someone suffering from Alzheimer's, right, is clearly losing this continuity of memories and, and things like that. So if what we mean by a person is that a certain kind of psychological entity that's self-aware, plans for the future, is, is you know, maintains a stream of memories, then yeah, I think there was a period of this organism's life, right, that there was no person involved there. And, you know, God forbid there might be a point in this organism's life when that person won't be around, right? I could have an unfortunate accident today where none of that psychological stuff's going on, okay? 
So I do think if what you mean by a person is that kind of psychological entity, then, then we're wrong on that, right? That there aren't persons in that sense from conception till natural death. And if that's what you mean by a soul, then yeah, I would agree. There isn't a soul that exists from conception to natural death. Okay. Um, and I and I think that you know the the you know the the ethical upshot of that is is fairly obvious, right? Uh, if indeed we think it's persons or souls that carry rights, and the duration of persons or souls is can doesn't overlap with organisms, then it's not clear that organism would always have the same rights as persons or souls. Okay. All right. Um, you know, famous with these sorts of views about persons. Or, or souls, you know, are, are these you know, things, you know, with, it would seem then if, if who I am or what I am is, is a set of psychological characteristics, right, then you should be able to, you know, transplant my brain into a different, you know, lower part of an organism, and they would essentially have switched my body, right, if the science fiction, maybe not science fiction, maybe some of you will be doing this someday, right, uh, you know, all that sort of thing, it would seem that wherever the consciousness goes, the personhood would follow, right? Because what personhood is, is just a kind of consciousness on this field. Okay. All right, now, um, that is not at all my view, okay? Uh, that is not when I say soul, or someone who occupies the tradition of philosophizing that I'm trying to represent to you says soul, that is not at all what we mean. In fact, I would say uh, in the tradition that I occupy, the word soul has nothing to do with consciousness whatsoever. Okay. Um, so stay tuned on that. If you look at uh, something like the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you can find this, this claim that the unity of soul and body is so profound that one has to consider the soul to be the form of the body. That is, it is because of its spiritual soul that the body made of matter becomes a living human body, spirit and matter in man, and are not two natures united, but rather their union forms a single nature, end quote. Okay, uh, I don't like proof texting things from like documents like that, but I, I just want to show you this notion of a soul as a form, as a form, okay, uh, is actually the sort of central view of, of the church, okay. And that note, that word "form" is loaded philosophically. Okay, uh, the, the, this is the, it's evoking this entire tradition of Aristotelian philosophy. There. Okay. So, what do we mean by that? Um, if I take something like this podium, uh, there's a strange fact about this podium and any other complicated physical object or complex physical object is it's not, strictly speaking, just identical to its parts. I mean, if we took the podium and we smashed it with a hammer, okay, or ran it through a wood chipper, the remains of it would no longer be a podium, right? It would be stuff you could make a podium out of, but you could also make a chair out of it, right? You could make other things out of that stuff. So if you look at it, the parts are not themselves sufficient to be a podium. It's always got to be the parts plus something else. I put something in quotes, so I'm going to be careful. I mean, it's not I'm saying there's a little podium ghost you add to that, okay? All right? But what I am saying is you have to have the parts plus, in this case, a structure probably or an arrangement. All right? So then in, if you want to be, you know, like philosophers do, be very, very precise, we would not say the podium is just the parts. It's the parts plus the structure plus the arrangement, Okay? Um, that's what, if you, if you go back to Aristotle and he makes this distinction between the matter of a thing and the form of a thing, that's what he's talking about. The matter is the set of physical constituents that have the potential to be that kind of thing, but also be other kinds of things. And the form is whatever has to be present in addition to the matter sufficient to have a certain kind of thing. So in the case of the podium, you know, the, the, the matter, depending on what level we want to analyze it, right, is a, is a bunch of, you know, wood particles, right? And the form is whatever was done to those wood particles such that we have something we can recognize as a podium, okay? Now, podiums are relatively boring objects, right? Uh, I would say there, there's not really something new that comes to be when you make a podium. 
it's really just arranged wood, okay? They're what Aristotelians call accidental beings as opposed to substantial beings, okay? But if you take something like a living thing, all right, you take, uh, you know, the, the tree outside, I guess there's one around here somewhere, right? Okay, if you take a tree outside, all right, that tree is not identical to its physical constituents in that strict sense that I was talking about the podium. Why? Well, if you take the tree and you run it through the wood chipper, okay, you don't have a tree left. You've got a bunch of stuff that could have could be a tree. How do you know it could be? It just was. But also, it's on its way, you know, to being decomposed and you know maybe eaten by other things and, and becoming other kinds of things. The the stuff that makes the tree has other potentials. Okay. So what is the tree? Well, the tree is a certain kind of physical constituent plus something else, what Aristotelians would call a form. What is that form? Whatever has to be present in the, with the physical constituents such that you have a tree rather than something else that could have been made of that same matter. Okay. What a tree form is, I don't know. I would, I would invite you to take it up with a botanist, right? That's not... And I think at that point you're getting to sort of specifically scientific questions. Okay. But the point here is, is that you've got this general theory of physical objects that Aristotelians hold to. That no physical object is just identical to its physical constituents. Everything is a composite of form and matter. All right? When it comes to a living thing, Aristotle called it the forms of living things souls. He used the word in, in Greek that we translate today as soul for the form of a living thing. So Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas are perfectly happy to say trees have souls. Okay? And it's not because they think there's a little tree ghost in there. Right? What they mean is, like any other physical object, right, this thing is a member of the kind it is, rather than other types of things its matter could have been because of this other constituent the form or the soul of the tree. Okay. And that sense, soul is a very boring concept, actually. Right? Um, and they, they give it a special name because they'll know, well, the tree's alive, right? It, it, it's animate, right? So they have, and they think that's a special kind of soul, but it's still, in principle, the same sort of relationship between form and matter and tree mm-hmm. as you have in the podium. Okay. Um, Take a living thing. Take a cat. We'll call him Fluffy. Okay. Um, maybe a trigger warning for cat lovers now. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, is Fluffy identical to his parts? No, he's not. All right. Uh, why? Because, you know, Fluffy, too, could f- end up on the wrong side of the wood chipper, right? And, and, and I, don't, I don't say that just to be crass, because, but what do you have? You have what clearly were the parts of a cat that are clearly no longer a cat. Okay, and, and, and the same organic constituents that make that cat up, right, at a certain level of analysis are the same kind of organic constituents that make up a dog. Or make up, you know, a small dog, right, a different quantity, right, or, you know, make up you and me. Right? So you have this matter that has multiple potencies, right, so clearly if, the, if Fluffy is going to be a cat, right, Rather than one of those other things, there must be this other constituent, right? This soul of the cat, this form, okay? What is it? I mean, maybe even it just is a structural arrangement among the parts of the cat, okay? I mean, I, that's not a hill I want to die on, what a cat soul is, okay? Um, but once again, in that case, soul is fairly mundane and boring, right? It's not, we're not saying there's a little cat ghost in there, right? What we are saying, though, is Fluffy's not identical to his parts, right? He's his parts plus this form, Um, and how do we know that? Because we know the parts could persist under conditions that Fluffy doesn't. And also we know that Fluffy can persist without all those same parts, right? If Fluffy just loses his tail to the wood chipper, we, you wouldn't congratulate me on my new cat, right? You would say, oh, poor Fluffy lost his tail, right? <laughs> well, so then clearly he's not just identical to the parts, right? And in fact, over Fluffy's entire lifetime, he will change over most, maybe even all, right, of his parts, like metabolically. And once again, then he's at no point is he identical to just any one of those collections. And so there must be this principle persisting throughout that we can identify him as not just a cat, but the same one. Okay. So, and in this respect too, I'm no different from Fluffy, right? 
I can fall on the wrong side of the wood chipper, right? And then you've got this 195 pounds of former human organic matter there. Uh, it's not a human. It can be a human, because it was. It could also be, you know, a, a Great Dane, right? <laughs> or, or it could also, you know, eventually, you know, will rot and become the trees and the grass and things like that. So clearly my parts are not sufficient for being a human, right? They're necessary in, in some sense, but they're not sufficient. So there must be this other constituent, the human soul, right? And so when we say that human beings have a soul, right, we're not saying something any in, like in generally generically different than what an Aristotelian or a Thomist would say about any living thing. That there's something that marks it out as that kind of living thing from other kinds of living things it could have been, that its matter could have been. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there, an important thing to note, there's, there's um, with, the, with soul in this tradition, the notion of function is, is closely related. Okay. So if we, you know, let's say I, uh, you know, set Fluffy in the chair here. Okay. So he's in physical contact with that chair, he's, and he's interacting causally with the chair, right? Or you know, let's say he's pushing the chair or something like that. So there's, there's, there's a relationship between Fluffy and that other physical thing, but we would say, you know, that this physical thing is not part of Fluffy, okay? Well, maybe he's just in the chair for a while. Well, we could, you know, put a collar on Fluffy, and he would wear it for the rest of his life, and we wouldn't recognize the collar as a part of Fluffy. We would recognize it as you know, um, an accessory, right? Something has an accent relationship with. Well, why is that? It's because the chair or the collar are not integral to any of the natural functions of a cat. Do, do you see that, right? Like, so whether or not something's a part of a substance for a cetillion is a question of whether or not that thing plays a role in its natural function, okay? Uh, Fluffy isn't set up, right, to need a collar or a chair to run and hunt, right, um, make me sneeze, <laughs> uh, you know, make more, make more cats. He does all of that just fine without the collars, okay? And likewise, you know, the chair you're sitting in, right, is not part of you because it doesn't play any role in your natural function, okay? So what defines a set of parts as the matter of a certain kind of substance is the relationship those parts bear to the natural function of that substance. Okay. And, you know, why, why do we think, you know, when Fluffy loses his tail, right, he's still a cat, right? Well, he's still alive and still disposed to only certain kinds of changes and activities that are relevant to being a cat. Do you see that? Right, so my, my point is, is like this notion of identity and persistence is wrapped up with something's disposition to develop and act in ways relevant to that kind of thing. Okay. Does that make sense? All right, so here's kind of where I'm going with this. Is if a soul is simply that which makes something a member of a kind rather than a potential member of that kind, and the mark of a soul is that the thing is actually disposed towards activities, right, that are exclusive to that kind of thing, all right, then I think we, we can see why we answer some of these questions the way we answer them. Okay, so the idea here is, is you would have a cat, you would have a cat soul present as soon as you have an organism that's disposed towards, whether it's doing them or not, it has this disposition towards cat-type activities rather than, say, dog-type activities or human-type activities or other kind of organism-type activities. D does that make sense? All right. Um, and even, even if the cat isn't doing anything particularly feline-like, right, as soon as it has a disposition to do those things right, that no other organisms have a disposition towards, the Aristotelian says, yeah, it's got the nature of a cat. It's got a cat soul at that point. And likewise for the tree, likewise for the tree, likewise for a human being, etc., etc. All right. 
um, something like Fluffy losing his tail, okay, you know, he's probably not, what, probably he's a good a climber, right? They, don't they need the tail to balance, right? Um, you know, probably, you know, not as deft a runner, what have you, okay? It's still, so he's hampered, right? He's not as good at being a cat as he once was, but he's still the kind of thing that under natural conditions would do those things. He's just been injured. You see that? Like, you wouldn't say of, like, you wouldn't say of me, I lack a tail, right? Because under natural conditions, I don't have, I guess, at some point gestation, but at this point in my life, right? I don't have one, right? <laughs> Whereas you would say of Fluffy that under natural conditions, he would have one, okay? So even though he lacks the tail now, he's still an organism that is disposed towards having a tail, right? Which distinguishes him from other kinds of organisms. Okay. All right, so here's the punchline then. In this tradition, we would say, or we do say, that something has a human soul simply at the point that it's identifiably a human organism. Because what we mean by a soul is that which makes something the kind of thing it is, as opposed to other kinds of things its matter could be. When would we say it's identified a human organism? As soon as it has a specifically human set of developmental dispositions. All right. Okay, so when you think of them, when, 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 when you know, Catholics say things like, the soul is present at conception, right? Uh, or you know, the, the soul is present throughout human development, it's actually a fairly boring claim. Right. It's just saying, on this view, we're saying it's, it's a member of the human species at that moment. Okay. D does that make sense? Right. I, don't, I will not attempt to like, weigh in on that scientifically to this audience, right? but, but I will say that's what we're claiming. Right. All right. Um, and so, do I think that like, the human soul is a special kind of soul? Yes, I do. Right? Do I think that the human soul is separable from matter in a way that other souls are not? Yes, I do. Right? Um, and there's all sorts of metaphysical debates we could have about that. But for this concern, none of that makes any difference. Do you see my point? Right? Uh, whether or not the soul is immortal, separable, all that has nothing to do with this. So, like, the question of the soul here is whether or not it's present at these points of development. Right? And I would say it's almost trivial to say that it is, because if it's developing as a human being, by definition, it would have a human soul. Right? Does that make sense? All right. um, I often tell my students that good metaphysics takes what are otherwise like really sexy and cool questions and ponderous and makes them really boring. Right? And this is a case where that's what happens. Uh, and I know uh, some of you have classes coming up, and I want to have time for you to batter me questions. So I want to stop there, and we can do questions. Right. Your name, sir? My name? Yeah, I hate to do an AU thing. <laughs> My name is Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, yeah. um, thanks so much for coming and talking to us. Really Good job. Um, so there's probably so many variables that you, you you like don't have the time to like speak to, but um, you being a Catholic, like obviously believe in a higher power. But all of what you said, especially Aristotle's like view of matter and nature, mm -hmm. don't necessarily necessitate a higher power. It just you just need to have the matter arranged in such a way for forming a specific function. Yeah. But that doesn't necessitate any sort of metaphysical reality or the deity or any sort of higher power. It just is what we observe and like the arrangements and the functions. Yeah. If you to, so how would you speak into that? Yeah, so, um, you know, one, you know, if you look at me, Aristotle's definitely a theist, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think his theism, I think this is your, I think your very good point, has really no bearing on this issue, right? Nor does mine, right? You see, this is my point. And, and I think by understanding what we mean by a soul, we can see it, it's a even if controversial, it's a perfectly secular claim to make, right? Uh, I don't think I need any specifically religious premise to make this case. Now, we can debate about whether, whether or not being an organism as such is sufficient to have moral rights and that sort of thing, and that's fine, right? Maybe we need religious premises for that, right? I don't think we do, right? But, um, 
to see that at least when we claim there are souls here, right? Because soul has, why I don't like the word, has this heavy religious connotation. It's not a religious, mystical claim we're making. We're just saying it's of a human kind. I was more curious how you yeah. draw the line then from that secular claim to you. I don't think anyone can deny that yeah. a soul then exists based upon your definition. Right. But how do you draw the line then? Like, have the connection, rather, yeah. to make a religious claim. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary to make a religious claim. Right. Um, now, if we want to get into immortality of souls and that sort of thing, different, yeah, then I think we're going to get into properly religious concerns, right? But in this one, I think it's not a religious issue. Really good question, by the way. Your name, sir? Eric. Eric. So you talked a lot about the predilection for becoming a human and yeah. having the form of the matter there being consistent to make this yeah. a human organism. Can you talk about cases in which that would be different? And maybe this is getting too medical for the yeah. theme of the talk, but if there's, let's say, a gross chromosomal anomaly and yeah. so the kid is genetically different than other, I hate to say normal humans, yeah, yeah, but yeah, then yeah. the typical developmental pattern of the human. Yeah. The question about, like, let's say they're missing an X chromosome and have Turner syndrome or right. such like that, would that be considered not human? And then yeah. questions when other parts that other people would say are necessary and sufficient for being human, oh, sorry, um, not sufficient but necessary for being human, such as the presence of a brain and then brain right. death and anencephaly and, and then yeah. across religious groups too and yeah. faith traditions, how does that look? Right. So, like, brain death from the perspective of Buddhism versus Catholics versus right. secular. When, when it comes to issues like uh, brain death, euthanasia, that sort of thing, um, that's the sort of thing I won't speak about because I'm not an expert. And, and, the, and there's no such thing as sort of generic cases in those. They're all so specific to the, the actual case that's going on there uh, and what type of injury you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, I'll punt, I'll cowardly punt on that. Okay. Then can you just um, like, yeah, but I will, I will say this, though. In, in when it comes to injury, that sort of thing, my view, though, is, without being able to say when or this does or doesn't happen, uh, if it is still a living human organism, right, then I think it's still me. Because right? I don't see my identity as having any kind of consciousness as a necessary condition. Okay. So, because I think there were times when I wasn't conscious, and I think there might be times when I'm not going to be, right? Um, and so, if it's still a living human organism, then I think it's still me, okay? Uh, now, leaving that aside, uh, about the, the chromosomal issue, all right? If, it's, if it makes sense to say there's a chromosome missing that ought to have been there, okay, then it seems to me what you're talking about is a human organism that under proper uh, circumstances would develop along these lines. So I want to see that as a sort of genetic injury, right, uh, in the way that I could have an injury to my brain right now or something that would be deeply hampering. So if it may, my view on it is if it makes sense to think of that in terms of a kind of injury or a hampering, and it's still biologically, you would still classify it as a human being, a member of the species, then I would say, boom, human soul, it's one of us. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Good answer. Martin? Martin. So, as a scientist, whether a scientist has a faith or doesn't, I think it's hard for them to escape sort of a deterministic sort of thought, because everything we do, we think, arises from something else that happened in the yeah, past. Yeah. It comes from some combination of forces that happened in the past. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or yeah. Aristilian, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, 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 that things have a cause, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what I understand your, your, your and, and the um, Aristotelian definition of a soul is that really it's just sort of classifying things yeah. along a certain, a certain function. Or that in it that makes it classifiable or something like that. That makes yeah. it classifiable. But all that, whether it's a podium or a tree or a cat or a person, mm -hmm. if you're just having a deterministic mindset, mm -hmm. is just a result of things that happened prior, or, or, or forces and matter that happened sure. Sure. prior to that. So it, 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 I think this gets to, to value and why we would value one form versus yeah. another form. I mean, if everything is sort of determined, yeah. how would you say that having a form of a podium is less valuable yeah. than the form of a cat or a form of a, or of a, form of a tree? And how do you yeah. justify that with sort of a deterministic mindset? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, so so if certain attributes are just intrinsically more valuable than other sorts of attributes, then maybe we'll come back to that. Right? So supposing that there are attributes of things that are more valuable than, than other kinds of, kinds of attributes. Whether or not those more a valuable attributes come to be through a deterministic or an indeterministic process, I don't see as relevant. Do you see what I mean? So if, if I got $100 <coughs> from somebody and they gave it to me freely or they gave it to me deterministically but legally, right, <laughs> then I don't think it makes a difference for the value of the money. Right? Mm -hmm. Not that we think of human value in, in that kind of crass way. <coughs> Um, but then there's this question, though, always, and this is like the classic thought from his problem, is, well, why would some type of characteristic be more valuable than another type of characteristic? Okay. Um, this, this kind of becomes like sort of, you know, uh, a baseline first principle. It just seems to me that an animal that can have this kind of conversation that we're having right now is more valuable than a podium because there's this there are these things we can do that podiums can't do, and we're more valuable than a cat because there's these things we can do that no cat can do. So for me, the the, the value comes from you know, the way the way Aristotle or Aquinas put it is that there's there's this greater scope of being that we have, right? We can do all the kind of vital functions of a plant, you know, the, they call it the vegetative or alive, and we do all the sort of sensory functions of an animal, but then we have this further thing. Um, rational moral agency, that sort of thing, that they would say, yeah, that's just in virtue of being able to do more, right? We be more, and therefore there's more goodness to us, right? And isn't that just sort of a, um, something that we accept intuitively and subjectively, yeah. Yeah. but we can't really argue? There's yeah, no way but, to argue. Exactly. But at, at some point, though, everything's going to ground out in this kind of like first principle, right? And I think something like human beings have a certain kind of value is, is a first principle of ethics, right? And I have no way to really motivate that, right? Do you see what I mean? Nor does someone who says, you know, like, like an extreme utilitarian who would say, you know, that, that, that there's nothing with intrinsic value, it's just a question of preference, right? There's no way to really motivate that premise either. And this is, you know, welcome to post-modernity, right? <laughs> right? That, that we end up with these clashing intuitive claims. And I'll admit, I don't have a way to motivate that. Though I think it's I find it difficult to take terribly seriously that someone doesn't see all the things we do as giving us a kind of dignity, right? That things they can't do it aren't you know, that possess. Does that does that make sense? But I know that it makes it very hard to say argue for this in a hospital setting, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, sorry, I've been told right. I asked a lot of questions. Please. Um, so I'll tell you, I'd love to take you back home with me in my classroom. <laughs> <laughs> There's the no idea that we all evolved from a single common ancestor. Mm -hmm. You could argue at that point that that common ancestor, given enough time, several billion years, yeah. could have had the propensity to really evolve into anything. And then as it di divided and grew and kind of branched off and took on genetic changes over time, we created a branch, like a river or a tree, and things slowly became more different. However, they all originated from the same propensity. Yeah. So would you argue then that because we were all here and we've had different damages or we've acquired different traits, can you discuss whether that would make us have different souls? Or, I mean, we have different matter, but yeah. would we all have originated from the same soul? Or are we then equivalent in some degree? And could you therefore make a leap to rights for animals, plants? So oh, we support? being animal kind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, we've so, given a few genetic damages yeah. or acquired acquisitions from a chimpanzee, yeah. for example. Yeah, you know, and there's always the, these issues of, um, you know, I, I'm of a school of thought that, you know, a lot of other, like, Thomas went much like, but I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not really interested in whether or not, say, like, a coyote and a, and a wolf are, Intrinsically different, or they're just sort of different moments in a stage of, of overall development. Do you, do you see my point? Right. So, whether that there's a distinctive coyote soul or wolf soul, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to kick that to biologists. Right. I do think, though, at, when you start talking about living things as opposed to non living <coughs> things, and conscious things as opposed to unconscious things, and rational things as opposed to non rational things, I think you have threshold differences there. You have intrinsically different kinds of things, okay? So I'm happy to, to, to grant common ancestry, all right? And however this came about, um, 
is not a concern for me. But I think when you get to something like us that has these capacities that we have um, for the kind of abstraction, the, the kind of um, questions we're asking now, that you don't see an analog to another animals, I'm willing to say, yeah, there is an intrinsic difference there, and there's a different kind of soul at work there. In the same way that when you get even just a conscious, say, fluffy or cat, it's conscious, right? And we don't see a clear analog to that in lower things, right? Then I'm willing to say, yeah, it, at that level of, of organization, there's a different intrinsic, you know, a threshold difference, and therefore there's a different kind of soul there, right? Now, if, if tomorrow um, you, you could demonstrate to me that dolphins are, you know, at rational in the same way we are, and they are indeed asking, you know, whither does dolphin kind come, right? And, all right, if, if I, I would be happy to then say, in fact, a dolphin, in the metaphysical sense, is a kind of human being. And it would be wrong to snare them in our nets when catching tuna, right? I still, I don't know what you're saying, but you, you see my point. Uh, and so, and I, I'd be happy to say, yeah, if you could show me that indeed there are other kinds of animals that do these kinds of things that we do, then in fact, they would by definition be rational animals in this in this sense, and I would say, yeah, then they bear the same rights that we do. And so then with... I think we're far from seeing it. With regards to their potential for reason, and assuming yeah. that, would humans who don't have the physical capability mm -hmm. to reason, would they still be caught by this propensity of humankind, yeah. of kind to reason? Yeah, because, well, because I would say, if, if you showed me a, uh, a child with Down, or an adult with Down syndrome, and you showed me a German Shepherd, okay, <coughs> I would not say the German Shepherd has a genetic injury, right? I would not say he's being deprived of, of capacities normal to his kind, right? Whereas I would say the Down syndrome child, that this is someone who suffered a genetic injury of some sort, right? And is being deprived of capacities relevant to his kind. Do, 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 you, do you see that, right? So, I mean, there was a stage in my life, right, uh, when I was not able to have this conversation, you know, wh whither do we all come, right? because I just simply wasn't online yet, right? So it's not the exercise of the capacity, it's being the kind of thing that under normal conditions has that capacity. And I would say that's true of a, a, a Donald's person. But it's not true of a, a German Shepherd. Yeah, your name, ma'am? My name is Anna. Um, I, I feel like in some religions, there's like a different kind of soul and spirit are used interchangeably, mm -hmm. um, but with the way you describe soul as kind of like a form, I feel like it's different from the idea of a spirit being something that, that persists yeah. after we die. And so, yeah. it, do you think those words are different? And if yeah. so, does spirit entail like the consciousness that people have been trying to put as defined yeah. as what soul is? Yeah, so I, I don't, um, I know, like, you know, in in the New Testament, in St. Paul, there's a distinction between soul and spirit, right? I don't have anything like that in mind, okay? Um, but, you know, do I, do I believe that um, a human soul is, you know, is separable from the matter, that it can survive the death of a human body? Yes, I do, okay? And I think there's arguments we can make for that, okay? Um, do I think human souls are conscious, right? I do not think they're conscious under their own steam, okay? I think everything human beings do is dependent on their physiology, okay? So I don't think we can give an exhaustive account of human thinking in terms of our physiology, but I think it's abundantly obvious that our physiology is a necessary condition of our thinking. Does that make sense? Um, this is why, in the Christian tradition, the resurrection of the body is really good news, right? I mean, Aristotle thought there was an immortal soul, but he thought, so what? It's just my soul. It's not me. I, I need my body to do anything that I need matter to do anything that I do. So he saw the idea of a disembodied soul as at best boring, right? Uh, and, and it's not until you have something like Aquinas says, aha, this resurrection. You get your body back, and, and then you'll have these things going on. So um, I don't see the soul as the carrier of consciousness, right? That is my, my organism, right? Do I think there's something about human consciousness that's not explained bodily? Yes. Do I think that gives us some reason to think that the human soul could persist without a body? 
Yes, right? But I don't see the soul as the consciousness carrier. That's the human organism. Does that answer your question? Yeah, your name, sir? Peter. Peter. So this is this is kind of getting at what she's talking about. Sure. And, and I guess I'm sort of asking you to shift gears a little bit to sure. take more of a broader spiritual uh, or religious... Sure. Uh, I, I know you, you wouldn't necessarily argue for it through natural law, but... How does something spiritual connect with what you're talking about in terms of uh, human beings under a lot of religious traditions being spiritual in addition to uh, physical organisms or entities? Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think a human being is a spiritual thing. I think a human being is a kind of animal, right? Uh, I came to be when this organism came to be, and I'll cease when this organism ceases. Okay, um, That's different from saying I can give a materialist account of everything about a human being. Okay? So I, I, when I hear you say you know, human beings are spiritual, what I take that to mean is, yeah, we're not the sort of thing that we can give an exhaustive materialist account about. Okay? the way we can the podium, right? That simply in terms of the forces of, of the physics involved, ultimately, right? Um, but that doesn't mean I am not inherently, necessarily a bodily being. Does that make sense? Right, so, so then uh, how is that different from, say, the cat? Uh, you said the podium, yeah. and, and that makes sense. So like, how is it different from the cat? Like, does the cat have a spiritual element to it? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, when cat when, when Fluffy's done, there's nothing about Fluffy that makes me think its soul is special, and so Fluffy's soul would not persist, right? And I don't think there's, in the sense of using the term, there's anything spiritual about the cat. Right? Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right. But I do think there's spiritual in the sense of humans, and I, I do think our soul is separable from matter, right? But I think we I think we so overplay that that we start to think of ourselves as these ghosts trapped in bodies, right? But we're not, right? We're, we're bodies, right? That are composites of matter and soul, right? But we're still bodies. Right? Yeah. Um, this is a little bit of a different question. Sure. Just uh, you were talking about assigning value based on on organisms uh, like me mental faculties and ability to be self aware and ask existential questions, and that's why if like a dolphin starts to ask these questions, you would be against like fishing them and destroying them. Um, but what do you think about the advent of AI, the advent of like certain machines, for example, that may have as much, if not better, men like processing faculties yeah. uh, over humans, yeah. the ability to be self-aware and all of this, yeah. would you say they're more valuable or as valuable as humans? Um, for really technical reasons, I just don't think AI in that sense is possible. Okay. Uh, I, I think whatever it is we're doing, it's not something that is captured by what's done by a digital computer. Okay. That's not to say that t computers aren't going to beat us in Turing tests, or already have, right? Uh, it's not going to say that they can't uh, process quicker. But I, I don't even like the word process, because process is already like a psychological term that we're like, like, putting in there, okay? Um, so if you, if you want to know my reasons for that, Google the Chinese room, okay? There's a famous thought experiment that I, that I think, it's controversial, but I think it's decisive. And, 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 and basically the idea is, is um, Code in a machine doesn't mean anything until something outside the machine interprets it, right? Um, and so, even though I'm happy to say, yeah, the, the algorithms in, in machines will beat us in certain ways, they're not consciously doing so, okay? Um, so, I don't doubt that there's such a thing as AI in the sense that we have things that um, can move uninterpreted symbols around faster than we can, right? But the symbols are still uninterpreted until something conscious has a look at it. Does, does that make sense? I see what you're saying. But I, I know I it's a lot of assertion. I guess you have to be willing to like admit kind of what you said that you it can't be possible for a like a computer to like, be sentient. It's like yeah. I understand you have to put in a code, but eventually a computer could become self 
sentient could be like have its well, own ability to, to carry out its own. So the the, the, exam, the the thought experiment I have in mind goes like it's not mine, right? I'm not that right. Okay. But you have you have a guy in a room. We call it the Chinese room. Okay, and he does, he doesn't speak a word of Chinese. And in one window comes questions written in Chinese that are numbered, and he goes to a manual and matches the number and outputs the correct answer in Chinese. Okay, so essentially, what you have here is a an algorithm. Right? Uh, it's a function. <coughs> From the outside, he would appear to be a perfectly competent speaker of Chinese, right? But clearly, he is not, right? And it, the idea here is what, is, what does a digital computer do? It just takes uninterpreted code and it matches it to other uninterpreted code, right? Uh, and a human being that does that with a language is clearly not a speaker of that language. He doesn't understand the word of it, right? So whatever it counts for understanding or knowing or having a concept, it's not captured in the kinds of relationships that run digital computers. Does that make sense? So if, even if you said it's self-aware, now what you mean really, I think, is it mimics self-awareness. It gives the answers right, that, that it's programmed to give. right? And it, I'm not saying that um, if the problem is the computer is programmed, because in perfectly good sense, a lot of what I say is programmed, but I'm still aware of what I'm saying. right? Uh, the idea is, is like thought experiments like that, I think, show pretty decisively that that algorithm relationship doesn't capture what it is to understand something. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I think I have more. But I mean, it, 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 like, I'm irresponsibly going too fast. Okay, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.